sitting here with Paddy McInnes. Uh, he's the man. <laughs> first met, first met Paddy at Eddie Dawkins' How to Barbecue two years ago, and this is how much of a man Paddy is. He was brave enough and took control of a barbecue. So, you know, someone's got respect when they can take control of somebody else's barbecue. <laughs> Either that or Eddie's no good or lazy, one of the two. Yeah, Eddie's more of a socialiser than a, than a barbecue man, I think. Yeah, yeah no, it's good. So, um, being a man's man, tell us about what you got up to on the weekend, uh, chasing some pigs around out here. Yeah, we, yeah, we took, a, took a few of the Irish boys, Irish International Rowers Pig Annie. Yeah. Um, first time in New Zealand for the boys. First time holding a gun for the boys. Um, so we went up to, uh, to Tahara, um on the south co- on the west coast there, out south of Carthia. Yeah. This is four four of the Irish international boys have come over six weeks to come training down here. And um, yeah, so we took them out there and did some jet skiing and did some uh, some barbecuing and some beer drinking and then we went for a hunt on at night, took a couple of dogs out for a walk, but um no, no, no luck there. And then, um, so we, oh, well, we got a possum on the way home, with an African pipe, but um, bit of conservation while you're out there. Yeah, that was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was the first kill. Um, so that was their introduction to pest eradication. And then, um, yeah, then we then we set off in the morning, uh, and we and we bush with the forty forty and a couple of dogs. Yeah. And we were we were onto a pig within. Uh, 200 meters of where we parked up the bike into the bush and and it was all go. Yeah, that was how, good. How do Irish boys handle it? Because of course hunting in Ireland's pretty um, with upper echelon. You got to go to a private property and everything's all managed. And how, how did they find it? Just being out in the middle of the bush. Uh, yeah, I think. Well, after we killed the possum, I thought I think they realised that it was quite brutal. Um, but yeah, they uh, no, they really they really got stuck into it. Eh? They loved it. Um, well, we we didn't end up we ended up shooting up the forty forty because it was, it was um they bailed it then they bailed it they weren't holding it yeah um yeah so once that was happening and then and then it was it was getting stuck and there was a bit of bit of blood everywhere they were they were straight into a day and then and then Paul one of the Irish boys with his white skibbering rowing top um yeah he carried it out so there's a bit of blood all over him mate it was good they fully enjoyed it. Hope he uh, takes it home as a trophy for himself. Uh, yeah, I'm not too sure how he'd get on getting that draw through <laughs> customs, but they definitely have a few photos for for the memory. Nice. And how's it been having a bit of international flair over? Yeah, great. Yeah, it's been awesome, mate. These boys are super, super down to earth, chilled, and just super funny. You can sort of <laughs> any conversation with the Irish is just funny, eh? Just nice. a general conversation with their accents is is hard case. And so has that come about because of uh, the physiologist Caroline? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So their physiologist Caroline moved to, uh, to Rowan, New Zealand after the Olympics. Yeah. After that, she finished the Olympic cycle with them and um, wanted a, a new change and, and came and joined the New Zealand rowing team. And yeah, well, I met them uh, last year in Poland at a World Cup. They stayed at the same hotel and just, just clicked and they were just, just super, super good buggers, eh? And, good mates. Yeah, yeah. And then we, we sort of pitched the idea that they should come down here for a training camp because they normally go to Spain over their winter. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so one thing leads to another. And we jump on a flight and here they are for six weeks. Magnificent. And um, you've been in their part of the world. Uh, Henley Regatta, what's that like, mate? Uh, Henley was, was massive. Eh? There was a, I've only done one Henley, Henley last year and that was such an experience. It's like it's like no other regatta. You can't really, it's like a, like the Royal Ascot, you know, like a big, it's a big show pony event. Um, a lot of people go there, not even to watch the, to watch the rowing, it's the, the who's who, and yeah. go there and drink pins for, for a couple of days, but in terms of racing, it was it was awesome. Eh? You're from the start line to the finish line, there's just crowds on both sides, and it's just an awesome atmosphere to row in. It was cool. And it's quite a narrow course, right? Yeah, so yeah. there's two boats, um, head-to-head <laughs> racing, um, head-to-head knockout racing. Yeah, that was good. Exciting stuff. So, mate, um, who's Paddy McGinnis today then? Uh, Paddy McGinnis today is just, yeah, just your normal Kiwi block, I guess, you know. Uh, yeah, he's just rowing, full time rower, part time beekeeper. Yeah. Um, just trying to, trying to make a, make a career or make a start in something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, rowing's been has been what I've been doing for the last ten years. So I've fully invested everything into rowing. Um, so it's been good to, to pick up another interest and mm-hmm. um, and try to put as any any spare time into into another interest. So um, your bee keeping's been been awesome, mate. So I did a year's course through Lincoln um, last year and finished that, and and then Cam, my flatmate, we um, bought hives together and and sort of do the bees bees together. It's, it's just just locally. Or yeah, yeah. Well, we've got one right there actually. Yeah. Um, nice. <laughs> so one at one at a house on the deck, and then three at a mate's dairy farm out past the star line of the lake, and then um, seven more just out of Cambridge on a on a friend's property there as well. Nice. Mm. And so, what does that bring in in terms of quantity of honey? Uh, we haven't had any uh, any terms of uh, return on the honey as yet. Uh, so we got our first hive in October, and then it's hard because in your first year of of beekeeping, you, you get all your plastic foam. So you got ten frames in a box, mm-hmm. and so your first box is full of all your um, your one queen and all the all the workers and and the brood and. The reproduction cycle, and then you put a, a queen excluder on, which stops the queen from going up. And only workers got there. And then you put your honey honey supers on, mm-hmm. and then so you put these ten plastic foundations in there, and the bees have to draw out the wax before they can fill those wax cells with honey, which is a bit of a slow process. So the bees are all currently doing that and slowly starting to fill their honey source. So hopefully by the end of end of March, start of March, we should should have some honey to spin and, and bottle up. Nice. And how did you get started with the bees? Did you catch them or buy them? Or? Uh, I've given one from a from a from a company that sponsors me. Nice, the True Honey Co. So I went and did some work with them after returning from World Champs. So they gifted me my first one, and then I brought two. And then Cam, my flatmate, bought a couple, and then we caught three swarms. Yeah. And then um, and then we brought some queens and, and split some of the stronger hives. We split them and put new queens into into those ones and and. Then yeah, it sort of snowballed from there to, to where we've got now. A big commercial flock of 11 hives. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you get sparked on, on the bees, mate? Uh, I sort of grew up around bees, so growing up in Wairau, my sort of, well, godparents, I'd say, um, have a beekeeping operation in Wairau to cut through acres. So I've always been around them. I've worked in on a, um, in the extraction rooms. I worked down in the field as a, as a young fella. So it's always been in the back of my mind, beekeeping. And then, just through rowing, when I started rowing, I was doing a building apprenticeship, and I couldn't be hands on the tools the whole time, so I, I um, sort of flagged that, and I've just been full time rowing, and then I picked up a, picked up the extramural uh, apiculture course through Lincoln, you know, eighteen months ago, and, yeah. and that sort of started it, and then once you get your first hive, then you want three, and then you want seven, and then now we've got ten or eleven. Nice. Yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, it just sort of snowballed once I did the beekeeping course and got, got the first side and then, yeah, games on from there. Yes. Yeah, what's something we should know about bees? Uh, how, how do we save the bees? How do you save the bees? Uh, pesticides, not using, or in, insecticides, I should say. Yeah. So, um, using bee-friendly products. Um, so Bunnings is taking, I think it might be Yates. Mm-hmm. Yates is a, is a bad product. Oh. Um, so they're taking Yates off the off the market shelf. So there's products out there that aren't bee friendly, and and um, just by not mowing your lawns, <laughs> <laughs> as you can tell, you know, bee friendly lawn out there. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, just by planting planting bee friendly plants, and yeah, nice. And in my group, you you started rowing two thousand and eight. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So what was that? Your final year of school. Second to last year of school. Yeah, uh, sixth form, make your boys, Sint House, hostel boy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so did two years of, of school rowing at two Marty Cups, and um, which was more social than successful, <laughs> um, which was good actually. It's probably why I stayed in the sport, so, which has kept me in there. I'm the only one who started, who's kept rowing since from my year we started. Um, so two Marty Cups, and then I did two years of a building apprenticeship in Hawke's Bay. Um, and then I left in 2012 to come to Cambridge to, yeah. to um, try to do a rowing career. And yeah, it was a bit tough in the beginning. Like I came here in 2012 and trial time to 21s, missed out on that. So I sort of restructured, reset some goals. Uh, the following year, 
I'm trying to find a train three, so I missed out on that, so I was off for a great start. But then I was fortunate that I signed up to, to do some papers at Waikato Uni, and that allowed me to do World University Games in 2013. Yeah. So I went to, to Russia with the World Unis team in 2013, and that was, looking back, that was such an awesome tour. Awesome, awesome tour doing a university ad in Kazan, Russia. And then 2014 was my first and only under 23 year in the Cox Forum. We got second there in Brazen, Italy. And that progressed into uh, the reserve pair in 2015. And then the Elite Four in 2016, the last chance qualifying regatta in Lucerne, um, which ended up being unsuccessful. And then, so, uh, then the the Russian um, doping <laughs> scandal. Was that was that live when you were at the qualifying regatta? Nah, what? nah, not at all. So we done we did the regatta. We got third, so we missed out by you know a bit of whisker there. So we, were, you know, so we, were, you know, yeah, obviously pretty gutted. Um, and then myself and three of the other the guys, two from the, Nathan from the quad and the. The reserve pair, Bobby and, and Finn and myself. Uh, we uh, went for a boys' holiday to Vietnam and Bali, um, which was which was really good. Um, it was super cool. What we needed actually, you know, time away. Everyone was still overseas on the on the campaign, and we were out there just letting the hair down. Yeah. And it wasn't until we got to Bali in our second week, and um, we sort of scooted to Ubud for a couple of hours and signed into a the backpackers and checked our emails. And there was emails from our um, rowing organisation and some other that's saying, yeah, you're sort of on the next flight out of Cuda <laughs> that evening. <laughs> Where are you? Why are you answering your phones? You're in the best spot in Bali. you got to leave. Yeah, yeah. We just bloody paid for a big villa. And <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we were only there for about, I don't know, 45 minutes and then we're back, in, back on the scooters down to Cuda, um, trying to get hold of the guy who had our scooters because he was about cockfighting or something, so <laughs> there was lots of um, shenanigans happening. So anyways, we flew out of out of Bali prematurely and got back to New Zealand and yeah, it all sort of unsubbed to unfold that Russia was in a systematic doping accusation and one thing that just, it just snowballed, eh? It just, well, we didn't really even know much about it. We heard, we heard why we were coming home. And then we weren't supposed to I mention it to too many people. Yeah. But once the media got hold of it, it just every day it got bigger and bigger and it ended up being quite a big worldwide um, event. Oh, actually, I actually haven't seen the the program on Netflix. What's it called? Okay, so this is going yeah. to, I was going to ask you. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't watched it. I've, I'll, I'll probably will watch it, but I just, it hasn't been on my to-do list. It hasn't been an interest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was... It was there will never be. I, well, I hope not that there won't be a, another situation like that unfolding yeah. in the in the sporting er- event. No, and mm. so obviously you guys went through the sort of disappointment of not getting in, and then given a glimmer of hope, and then not getting in again. How was it? Like I'd seen you after the Olympic the Olympics and there's big reviews with it, with rowing and things and how you guys were operating. How was it coming back the next year and trying to focus that on a, on a full year? Ordeal again. Uh, it was good. Cause I mean, from that ordeal into well, after that we didn't. We got dropped from what well, myself and so another guy from the four. Myself and Anthony got dropped from from the four out of the national program. So we went back to the RPCs for summer, and so I sort of made a decision then to um, so that was our funding gone, everything. So I sort of said. Like all in again. Um, one last shot. Yeah. If I'm out, I'm in. If I'm out, I'm out. Um, and it, it ended up being successful. I jumped into the men's eight the following year. So, like, it was good. And then we had a good campaign in the men's eight. And, yeah, yeah. And so the motivation was super high. It's a new campaign. Um, yeah, that was good. Oh, awesome. So, what, what triggered your decision to go from two years in North Bay and move up here? Was it just to surround yourself with the you know, yeah high, high performance or it wasn't probably the high performance it was probably I never really set my goals too high as in terms of a high performance I sort of set it as the RPC which was a regional team because I just had I knew that you know I knew Evan Kennedy and 
Andrew Healy and, and Rob McCaig and some of those guys that were my age and Nathan Flannery who were all up here rowing for the RPCs and um, they were just having such an awesome time. Yeah. Back then it was probably a lot more social um, yeah. and I liked that aspect of um, doing a team of team sport and being super social off the water. Yeah. Um, which was cool. So I came up here then and made, made a whole new bunch of friends and I just fully immersed myself in the culture. It was wicked. And then that sort of progressed, I think, um, well, coming up around the London period, it was for us younger guys, I was only 20. Yeah. Um, going into the London to the to the Tokyo for your cycle, uh, it got a lot more a lot more serious and a lot more professional. You mean really Rio? Yeah, Rio, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah till, till it is now, and it's quite a, it's it's still a social event, but it's not, it's, it's not anywhere like it used to be. Yeah. Well, it might be for the younger guys that are in the RPC, but it's, um, yeah, for us guys now, it's, it's all pretty, pretty, um, pretty hard work. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, being in Hawke's Bay, like, once you finish school, is there a sort of feeling like of being left behind? Like, I don't know, you sort of see Hawke's Bay as sort of, uh, agricultural town, uh, there's the rugby team. Mm. What's it like rowing out of school in that, in that place? Uh, yeah, it was it was cool because I, well, I had an apprenticeship, so I was doing my apprenticeship full time and, and rowing part time, you could say. Um, I still had a lot, a few friends that were still going there playing rugby and, and a few of the older guys that were my, uh, my brothers a year and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's still a, a few people floating around, but yeah, if you weren't playing rugby or you you weren't doing something, I, I don't know, it just wasn't for me. I, I, I wanted to get away. And like a lot of my good friends all went to uni. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew that I'd come back to Hawke's Bay eventually. So I, I went away and, and did my own thing. I'm still doing it. And a lot of the guys that went away to uni, they were all, they're all slowly starting to come back to Hawke's Bay now, which is quite cool when you go home. Whenever I do get back there a couple of times a year, um, they're all they're all back there now. Yeah, yeah they're all got, you know full-time jobs and starting to settle down, which is, which is cool. Yeah. It's different, you know, I've been away for six years, but it, when every time I go back, it just doesn't feel like it's been six years. You, you know, like you bump into people, which is weird with social media, because you bump into people that you haven't seen for four, five, six years, but you follow them on Instagram <laughs> or social media platforms, and you're like, oh, shit, actually, I haven't seen you for a while, but it just seems like the other day that we were only having a beer or yeah. at school or something. Yeah, it's weird. Nice. And um, so you went to high school in, in Napier, is that right? Yep. Yeah. In primary school, Wairau? No, we left Wairau when I was six or seven. Yeah. Um, then went, went to Hawke's Bay. So I went to Marikako Primary School for 18 months mm-hmm. and then to then moved to out to Ocean Beach and went to Tomato for another 18 months, then to have Lockheed Bay at um, AP Boys. Mm-hmm. And, and it was just some hostel and AP Boys. Yeah, the hostel was good. I hope they should stay there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird. Oh, yeah, wow. Well, I, I went back. Oh, it wasn't even that long ago. It must have been a year, two years max. And I went back and I, um, it was after school. It was on a Friday. I was going through to go see the matron and the, the um, duty masters to say good day and, and the matron sort of walked down to me and I, it's quite I don't know she was just didn't seem something wasn't right and she's like oh and she sort of recognised me she's yeah. like oh, I thought you were here to pick up one of your children I've been away for a couple of years I'm not that bloody old yeah I don't have any kids yeah yeah no that's good it's always it's pretty cool to um to go back to the old school yeah you can sort of see why you send your you know there's a lot of old boys that send their kids to to the schools that they went to. Yeah. Went to. yeah. It's, um, going back there and walking through the dorms, it was it's pretty, brings back a few memories, eh? A lot of good memories. We still hear uh, Richard Turner on, on Sky Sports every time he gets the opportunity saying, this person went to Napier Men's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, it's definitely a cool school. It's um, The boarding house is cool. We, I, I suppose any, any boarding, boarding schools are, are pretty good fun as they're growing up, eh? And so, what what was sort of what were you like as a primary school kid? Do you think that is there anything about you today that is reflected back then? Uh, well, I don't dye my hair anymore. 
Um, no, nah, I was I was just a yeah, standard standard kid. I, mean, I wasn't even tall when I was at school. Like I'm two meters now. Yeah, six foot seven. Um, but back then I just I did mountain biking and volleyball, rugby, um, hung out at the beach, surfing. It's just yeah, just your average average teenager. Eh? It wasn't until I picked up rowing and, and committed myself to to it that I sort of well. I started growing a bit more and started filling myself out and, and making a, an athlete of myself. I wasn't yeah. really an athlete back then. I was just a standard teenager having fun playing team sports, I guess. Yeah. And so what, what got you guys into rowing? It was by coincidence. It was just a, one of the older guys in, in the hostel. Um, they did the Novice Four at Marty Cup and they won it. So Nature Boys were the, were the title holders of the Novice Four at Marty. So they needed... And you, and you, Nicky Boys, four to, <laughs> to, um, to try and win the title, which we didn't do. We we got fourth. So, um, well, we didn't win that, but I guess I, I made up for it in my later years. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you said, yeah, when you came down here, you missed, missed a couple of 21s and 23 crews. And, yeah. And like you said, the, the start of your own career was quite sociable and fun. What's kept you going? And you know, like you said, you didn't really set many goals when you got here. What? How do you think you transitioned to become an elite? Um, well, well, commitment. You yeah. have commitment. Um, if you just if you, if you stick at something for long enough, you eventually you're gonna you're gonna get there if you put in the hard work. So those first few years I knew I was there or thereabouts. Um, and all the you know all the the racing domestically against each other, I was there thereabouts. Yeah. Or so I knew that eventually I was get an opportunity. It was just gonna. Yeah, you know, grabbed the opportunity by two hands, and that was twenty threes. And so we did twenty threes, and we did a, you know, it was a super successful campaign. And so that twenty threes campaign led to a, a summer squad the following season, and then from summer squad it went to what well, summer squad is your first, just you know, as, as your foot into the elite team. So that was yeah, it was it was just a progression through universities, twenty threes, summer squad, elite team. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And so when you signed up for university, was that with the aim of running for university, or was that just yeah, yeah, yeah? yeah. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't after a degree. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lecture life wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, it was interesting though. I, I went for my exam, um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I signed up to to Waikato and did some environmental planning papers, which was was super cool. Um, yeah. Looking back now, I wish I wish I'd committed to it. Um, through the help of Prime Minister Scholarship, like, you know, all our study is, is there offered to us. I've just done other short courses and um, <clears throat> along the way. But yes, I signed up to Waikato University and it just, I think it's a good thing about rowing is it opens so many doors so that those couple of papers opened the door to a world, world team trip to, to Russia and then two or three great races with, with Waikato Uni. Yeah. Um, and the great race, the Gallagher great race was well, it's, I think it's on hold at the moment, but that's such an awesome event. Um, that was a, a week, a week of awesome activities with alumni from Harvard or Yale or um, Cambridge. Um, yeah, yeah. So the, the Waikato Uni um, experience was was a great one, even though I didn't finish my environmental planning degree. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so. The RPC seems to be having the trouble now where, where a lot of people are getting picked up. It seems to be a training ground for the US universities. Is there anybody coming knocking on your door after uh, the World Universities tour? No, not for me, no. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a huge one now. Is the, Well, they don't even go to the RPCs. They're going from Marty Cup to offer these scholarships to the US, which like, for me, I reckon it's such an awesome opportunity. Yeah. Um, looking back, I probably would have taken one. You know, some of these kids are getting full scholarships to Harvard, Yale, these Brown, they know, yeah. big universities. And, um, yeah, so, like, I think Rowan New Zealand's definitely getting on board now. That, you know, like, if, we, if they look after these kids while they go to America for, you know, three, four years, they're coming back and they're still going to immerse themselves into the under-23 team and then yeah. and into the elite team that way. But in the beginning, there was, I, I never knew anyone going to America when I was at high school. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. yeah. That's 
So, uh, what what's a typical day? At, you know, say the last couple of weeks. What's been a typical day? You said you're in the the end of the heavy load at the moment. What's what's been typical? You said four sessions today. Yeah, so we've had four sessions today. Today was two game of testing in the morning, which is a fitness test. Um, then that was followed up by a eight k in the single, sort of a delactate. Delactate row, stretch, stretch out. Um, back home for lunch, um, nap time. Yep. Big fan of, of napping. <laughs> day naps. Uh, so nap time, and then back down at. I was back down there at two o'clock, half an hour on the watt bike to warm up for weights. Uh, an hour and a half weight session. Uh, down to the athletic lounge, we chill out in the athletic lounge, and you know, yeah, refuel on a, some chocolate milk and some cream rice and some. What else is floating around in the kitchen? And then the boys went out for an hour of technique session in the small boats and the piers, and I was up on the watt bike. Yeah. Just because I'd been out in the single in the morning, and, and um, yeah, the single does knock out, knock around your hands a little bit. Yeah. Um, they, yeah. So I just try and look after my hands a little bit if I don't need to go out there twice a day in the single. Yeah. yeah. So, but the standard day is, um, is up at six, breakfast. On the bike, down to training, 20 minutes on the bike, get there at 7. 20 minute stretch, down to the boat bay on the water at 7.30. Hour and a half, two hours on the water. So average 20, 22k in the mornings. Back in, if you need to see any of the support staff, like physios or a masseuse, or you might have a nutritionist meeting or a psych meeting. Otherwise, back home, you know, 10.30, big Big breakfast, which is kind of or a big brunch, so yeah. um, nap time, and then um, yeah, then uh, then another small meal before your afternoon session. Afternoon sessions are either a row or a, or a weight session, or on a Wednesday we go for a, a road cycle. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that's um, basically a full day from seven thirty to five thirty. Just we get a bit of a siesta in the middle of the day for for nap time and, and lunch, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, pretty good. And we do that six days a week. Yeah. And are you, are you biking out there much or is the moment taking the care? Uh, in the summer, we definitely bike more. Um, mm. That's based on your coaches. So if you're having a big week and you want to get more volume in, yeah. um, you definitely ride the bike more. But if you're having a recovery week or you want to bring back the volume, you just jump in the car. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So you said 20 minutes of stretching. What do you keep focusing on that stretch? Uh... For us, for me, um, you've got your, your physio work on, so mm -hmm. sort of your, um, well, you just jump on, on the roller, mm -hmm. first and foremost, it's good, good um, the old scissor kicks off the, the legs, click the back, um, just your, your main muscle groups, I guess, your hamstrings, your glutes, um, you know, your lats, you're, you're hanging on to your lats quite a bit in the rowing stroke, and just whatever, any niggles you have, your, your physio work on. So what are you doing to get loosen up your lats? Uh, hanging onto the onto the side of the squat rack and just yeah. sort of stretching. Um, I don't really know the yoga poses or, or <laughs> what the names are. So like, sort of the downward dog, sort of yeah. get the scapulas moving. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not too good on the on the on the names of them, yeah. but um, there might be another video is um, sort of Patty's Patty's stretching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You sort of, you sort of, you get, you, everyone's got their own routines, and you, you know, you might see someone else doing a bit something different. Um, all the I have been, all right, I've got the the, the Tim Ferriss tools of Titans. Yeah, you read that out. Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's some some good stuff in there in terms of you just sort of pick stuff from what people do or you see people do and try that. If it works, it doesn't. If it if you like it, you keep it. And yeah, so you yeah mix it up, I guess. And I suppose you got Sophie McKenzie down there often. She must Not anymore, she, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've had I've had plenty of um, Sophie McKenzie inspiration. <laughs> um, I've been to a few of Sophie McKenzie's yoga classes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've got a I've got a, a network of ideas in my, up here. It's just um, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever I'm feeling. Yeah. If it's cold, you know. If it's warm, <laughs> how limber I'm feeling. Yeah. How sore and tired I'm feeling. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And. Um, you mentioned in sports psychology, what sort of stuff is, is a rowing athlete need to get in, in or outside of his head about? Uh, it's hugely on the individual way. Yeah. Um, so you, have, you have team physiology sessions, um, or you have your individual individual stuff. 
Yeah, like last year, when I wasn't in the system, um, I used a physio physiologist a lot, you know, just working on goals, oh, yeah, like goal setting and just tangible things and working out ways of keeping the commitment going or the, um, um, yeah, and just sort of working out what drives you to keep going mm -hmm. um, or if you're having, you're having bad days and or why you're having bad days and, but yeah, it's, it's hugely up to the individual, I guess, what, what, um, what they work on, but for me, I just, I don't use them all that much, um, but, um, yeah. Nice to see you guys, as the Kiwi 8, how many is in the Kiwi 8? <laughs> uh, the Kiwi 8, uh, well, you've got the, the nine of you. <laughs> yeah, that's um, true, gotcha. Then you chuck in, so the Kiwi 8 would be 10 with the coach, and then, and then, yeah, so I'd say it was a, it was a, well, originally we had a squad of 10, there was, yeah, and then we sort of seat raced and trialed, which got our uh, European eight, yeah. and then when we came back, we uh, redid that for the, for the world champs, and, um, yeah, so we had a squad of 10 there for a, for a while at home, training before we went to Europe, and which was, which was good, because there was no complacency. Mm -hmm. um, it was never there was never an eight as such. Everyone was always kept on their toes because if you, if you weren't performing, you you were sort of on the walking the line to be to lose your seat. Um, but the Kiwi Eight sort of is now a squad of fourteen of us. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a restructure in the men's pair because Jamie Hunter's retired from the sport. Uh, James Lash has now gone lightweight in the lightweight double, mm -hmm. so there'll be a new restructure in um, the bow seat there. And Trigus Conradi, he's taken a bit of sabbatical time out of the sport. Um, so these three are the guys from from the from the group. So there, yeah, there's going to be a change in in Kiwi. Yeah, there'll be new new faces, new seats changed around. So it'll be interesting come March at trials what the what the process. Um, will show and, and who will be in what seat, yeah. Yeah, and so what boats are you going to be racing come, come next year? Uh, come, yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually um, finalised any, any boats. I, there's restructured nationals as well. The Boss Rooster 4, which used to be the Premier Cox 4, which was a club event, mm. is now changed to the Coxless 4, which will be a club event, still Prem. So, I'll row, a, I'll row a four out of Hawks Bay with maybe Jack Moe from the Sculling Squad, um, otherwise three Hawks Bay rowers. So, I'll do a four. Not sure on the pier situation. I would like to do a pier at Nationals, but I um, yeah, would just see who's floating around the RPC. Oh. Um, and then we'll, well, we've, been, we've had the, the eights title at Waikato for the last four or five years, so we're not too keen on giving that up. So the eight will probably be yeah. um, the priority priority boat to keep the keep the title. Yeah, I suppose maybe a sculling event. I'd, I'd quite like to do a quad maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, a quad would be a quad would be fun. But we'll just see in the next couple of weeks what, what pans out. Um, Is your two metres, what's your role in the boat? In the big boat? Uh, in the big boat in the eight. Um, it's just sort of the work engine, you know, three seat there, sort of in the middle, just, just yeah, just being an engine, being a diesel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everyone's, yeah, um, yeah, we had, we had James in the bow, who was a former lightweight, gone heavyweight, so he was a bit of a, a weapon um, in the bow there. So the bow three sort of worked together. Um, as well as the stern three, stern two will work together, and then and then the four of us in the middle also work together, which collectively formed our eight. Yeah. So you had sections of the eight which would all sort of into into interlock and 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 work as a unit, yeah, which was cool. Eh? The eight that was the first international eight that I'd raced. Um, so big boats. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot going on. Big boat compared to a small boat, which was, um, yeah, it was, it was a cool campaign, an interesting campaign. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so, 
the eights and, and the singles that have kind of like, you know, big events at World Champs. What's the race like at South? Obviously, it's flat out, it's big, it's fast. It's, it's loud. It's loud. It's super loud. I don't think people understand how loud the start of an H race is, especially when you've got um, the Germans. The Germans are so loud. These they crew with themselves? Or yeah, yeah. The athletes, um, the English are loud. Um, everyone's, everyone's played loud, actually. There's a whole lot of heavy breathing, slapping the boats, slapping the legs. And then as soon as the old um, the buzzer goes, it's just full noise. Eh? You've got, you know, um, six coxswains just screaming. Um, you've got a whole lot of big dudes just heaving and screaming. Um, so, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's quick. You do, there's a lot of strokes going in in those, that first 250 metres. Um, and then it sort of settles. Well, it doesn't really even settle down, to be honest. Um, the first 250 Fifty meters goes so bloody quick, and then, then, then you're sort of you're settling in after the two hundred fifty meters, um, and by the five hundred, there's still only it's maybe separated by a canvas at that point. Um, so at World Champs, we were for those that don't know a canvas, that's the end of end of your boat. Yeah, yeah, so it's in the bow section, yeah. so um, and that would be oh what a meter and a half. Yeah, so it's pretty close. <laughs> um, there's never much separating a, a, a rate in an H race. So we came out flying. Um, we were second through the 500 with the Germans. We just set the new world record in Poland because we got second behind. Um, we were still second by the K, third by the 1500. And by that stage, we'd sort of... Here, yeah, we'd burnt the candle at both ends. Um, and once the, once the flame... Sort of yeah. burnt out. We were we were um, we crossed the finish line six, um, but yeah, no, we gave it everything. Eh? It was it was wicked. It was cool, awesome world champs. Um, yeah, we did as much as we could. Yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't leave anything out there. We went out went out strong and, and paid for it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um. So rolling over the line, uh, being six. What what's what's the feeling in the boat? How do you, what do you guys get up to after? Uh, it's a, a campaign. <laughs> it was pretty. Uh, uh, it was a bit of a somber feeling. Um, yeah. It wasn't much chat compared to you know to our qualifying heat where we would we would progress to the final when my drink is behind me had spewed up pineapple all over my back. <laughs> um, um, yeah, yeah. So it's a different feeling when you you just you've given it everything. You're fully exhausted and um, you haven't quite come away with the result that you'd you'd wanted, but. Um, yeah, we had a we had a we had debrief and, and a bit of chit chat and um, and then everyone sort of uh, we were three week three weeks away from from the from the team after World Champs. So everyone sort of goes off on their own ways and one of the boys went off to and got engaged and some of us went down to Miami and <laughs> saw Miami and a few of them went on helicopter rides to the Grand Canyon and yeah and then after you, you go do your thing for th- three weeks. You come back to the camper and you're ready to go again in a, in a squad situation, and and the it's no more eight yeah. anymore. It's a you're back into a squad, yeah. and you're all fighting for for a position in trials. Really, you know, you want to go into trials and and um, having had a good summer and and work the way up the the ranking order. You know, yeah. Everyone sort of knows that there's a ranking order throughout the summer, which peers are going fast and and whatnot. Really. Yeah, you say you roll over the line in exhaustion. Um, what's it like being at the start, knowing that you're about to put the body through hell for two k's? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you've just done two k's. Start seventy. The start seventy better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you've, you, I don't know. You're so you're so pumped up on on caffeine for starters. Not as much as the Irish. The Irish take like nine hundred milligrams. Yeah, they can they can they can handle the caffeine. Those boys. Um, yeah, you see, well, you've, you're pumped up on caffeine, you're pumped up on adrenaline, um, you're pumped up on sodium bicarbonate, yeah. which is pretty much baking soda, yeah. um, which has its side effects. Well, you're trying, you're trying to buffer your lactate with that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, um, um, yeah, so the, start, the, the feeling at the start of a, of a 2K race is you're feeling pretty good. You, is you, it, so is that better alanine or is that separate again? Better alanine separate again. Yeah. Um, and you, are you taking that? I don't take better alanine myself. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I just, yeah, not for, you. not for me, um, but, you know, people do, you load, 
nine weeks out of yeah. his LNA. I guess he's a tangles. Have you yeah. ever had it? No, nah, but it's been there. My brother has stuck here with the RPC and visited him and he had some like, this is crazy. Man. Yeah, <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't for me. The first time I ever had it, someone put like two or three tea, like, teaspoons into a drink and gave me that, which was like three times what you're supposed to, your daily dose, your loading dose. And honestly, it gives you the tingles in your arms and your legs, and it's just a, it's a weird feeling. So, a bit of alanine's not for me, but the sodium bicarbonate's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, do you, do you get that screaming muscles? Or? You still get it, but it, it, just, it just prolongs that, and it. I don't know, it sort of makes your, well, your legs feel a little bit numb. Yeah. You can push, it's not, it's not like you're pushing hard, it's that you're pushing, you don't feel the burn as such mm-hmm. that you do without having be, um, sodium bicarbonate. Like some people take it and some people don't, it's up to the individual athlete. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it starts loud, are you someone that's hyped up, or are you, are you trying to keep calm? Yeah, I keep pretty calm, eh? Yeah. Um, I don't think many of the Kiwi guys, are, we, don't, we don't really get too loud. Yeah. Um, I like the I like the da- I like the the Germans though the Germans are loud man, and the and the English. Um, you yeah, expect that from the US and Canada. <laughs> yeah, well Canada wasn't there. Yeah, the US. Yeah, maybe the, the US were. I don't know. You you're just sort of in your own little zone in your own bubble, and you don't want to get distracted by what they're doing. Yeah, you know you've got your own start process of just. Deep breathing, just relax. You want to relax, as, you know. Like we've gone through a warm up on the water, or well, yeah. a warm up on the land, and then a warm up on the water. And by that stage, you know you kind of want to relax fully. Um, so as soon as that green light goes, it's all it's all hell breaks loose again. Yeah. Yeah. So no, nah, not not for me. I'm not a I'm not one to <laughs> get carried away. Yeah, yeah, and try and intimidate anyone else. I'll just do my thing. Sit nice. there and. So you said you you went to Miami. Was was it a, a blur, or did you were you able to take in the experience? Yeah, I took in the, my own experience pretty yeah. good. We um myself and Rebecca Scown, well, she retired from the sport after yeah. World Champs in Sarasota, so um we cruised down to to Miami in in a, in a convertible. You know? <laughs> it, well, actually it rained, so we tripped down to Miami. We didn't actually get the hood up or the the old doodah off. <laughs> um, but yeah, when we cruised around Miami and we saw the sights in the convertible for a few days and it wasn't raining and um, walked down the beach and almost got blown over. <laughs> Don't know, it's bad luck with the weather. Yeah. Didn't get to go swimming, it was windy as anything. Tropical storms rolling. Oh, because it was after the hurricane yeah. came through. But to be honest, you didn't really know that there would have been a hurricane there or sight. Yeah, yeah. hurricane. Yeah, the, the coconut trees were a bit blown over and. Um, but no, no structural damage that we were aware of. Yeah, so I quickly had a flip through your Instagram before I came here in my own Sarasota. You were tempting the, the alligators. Yep. And uh, my man said that uh, some of you guys were feeding some alligators out the back of your hotel. Yeah, yeah, there was a couple of paleo tolerant <laughs> alligators. I, get, I try to give it bread, <laughs> bread, bread on a stick. It was, yeah. Well, you know, like I've never seen an alligator before, and none of us had seen alligators. So once we found out there was an alligator behind us, a hotel where we're all quick to get out there and, <laughs> and see the alligator. It was only a baby alligator, it must have been a meter. But I still wouldn't want to take on a baby alligator. Um, so that's why I put some bread on a stick and, and got it to get out of the water and snap at it. Yeah. And then oh. posted the photo on Instagram and it was quite good. Everyone was like, Well, you know, alligator and then and then we didn't we didn't actually know that it's um, illegal to, yeah. to feed alligators. <laughs> so someone had commented on the photo that's highly illegal and yeah, so I heard a, a sign got put up. Or... Yeah, yeah. So a sign got put up on the on the on the door. Where up, do not feed the alligator. You'll be prosecuted. So there was no more alligator feeding after that one. Nice, nice. And so um, when you got back to New Zealand, had you had your wind down? Uh, well, I was, uh, yep. So came back into New Zealand and then it pretty much went straight into into beekeeping. Yeah. Um. So the True Honeyco who's sponsored me for the last. Five months there through that campaign, um, uh, based in Hawke's Bay, in central Hawke's Bay, down in Waipawa, Waipak. So I went down there on the, I flew on Sunday and then started work there at 8 o'clock on the Monday. Um, and it was cool, went out there with all the, all the boys and just fully immersed myself in beekeeping life and just got stings everywhere, a couple of allergic reactions, so I was a bit nervous when I got a 
knee-jerk reaction, like big X and marks across my arms and with big welts across my stomach, I was thinking, ooh, this could not be a career for me. Yeah. But a, a few antihistamines later, that all went away, and I just preloaded the antihistamines the next day, and yeah, so the bee stings, just came immune to the bee stings. Yeah. Um, some days I had big old boxing gloves, eh? Yeah. Just, the stings just, you get so many stings being a bee giver. And so exposure works, you're not too bothered by them now? Yeah, no, sweet, sweet bugs now, <laughs> eh? Or, although, like, I got one on the jugular the other day, that wasn't, that wasn't too far, and one on the eyebrow, and that puffed out the whole eye, and I rocked up the training with that, and everyone, it's a bit, bit dumb. Yeah, bit scary. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've also still got your Movember title out there. Yeah. And, and um, so, and you and Robbie at the World Champs Big Mice. Uh, what's what's uh, men's out in Movember sort of mean with you? Uh, yeah. Well, I never met either my grand my granddad's my on dad's side. He was um he passed away with uh, men's health issues, so I'd never met him. Um. But yeah, it's just you know, like the Movember campaigns. Also, it's awesome for men's health awareness and signing up to to Movember and raising a few funds for them, and and just the the POD, you know, <laughs> the point of difference of having a moustache is always always quite good. I, it's been a bit of you know, it needs a bit of a tidy up to be honest. I've been a bit been a bit slack on it lately, but um, yeah. Well, after I I. I went through a stage of having long hair and having the man bun. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, so I'd done the man bun um, for a while. So now I'm just sort of prepping the the, the Movember carried on to the, the the December, to the Christmas mow, and now it's, um, yeah, now it's January. So yeah. I'm pretty keen on getting a bit of wax and just sort of seeing where it can go, and just, just in the ends. Or, I don't know if you've had a most ushers so I'm enjoying it. <laughs> no, it's looking good. It's looking good. And so what was what was the man bun about? Are you a Game of Thrones fan or something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I started with the man bun in 2014. And um, I just, I've never done it again. It takes so bloody long to grow long hair. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> you get to a stage where it's long, not long enough to tie up, but too long to wear out. So you yeah. actually have to wear a cap wherever you go. And if you, Rowing, it's a pain in the ass because it gets in your face if you don't have a hat on. So I don't know. Anyway, I grew up along here and had this man bun, and it was it was funny, you know. Clap of it, <laughs> corn braided it. Yeah. Um, that Keep was, it. Apparently, that's racial. Um, oh, I can't think of the word. Second word. Corn yeah. braids. Yeah. But like anyway, an Eskimo yeah. pie. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I um. They maize, a maize, a maize plowed it, you know, yeah. the maize strips. Um, yeah, so anyway, then I got rid of the man bun and back to back to the stock standard number four all over. Yeah. And um, kept the moustache, grew a moustache. Yeah. It's good to have something to, to keep you busy. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know, we know what the chasing bees are around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd rather have... Well, I think bees are attractive to long hair. Well, I wouldn't want, wouldn't want to have a bee stuck in my hair, to be honest. So, no. Um, yeah, yeah. Potential yeah. health and safety issue there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, are you boys owners of your bee company, or are you just small players? Uh, small players. Um, we actually haven't got a, a business name as such yet, which is on the on the to-do list. But, um, you yeah, know, we're all fully registered and... And ready to go um, in terms of our, our beehives. We just we just you know small players at this stage. Um, I think once we we need a ute, it's not um, <laughs> it's not sustainable to, to drive around in in the sense of you're a wagon with bees in the back. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know once you've got ten hives and you get twenty hives, we're definitely going to need a ute yeah. in the in the for the for the business. So once we get the ute, we'll be be away laughing, I reckon. Yeah. Um, what would you, would you say is uh, key for getting into bees? Um, make sure you're not allergic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, where, where did you sort of learn the most? Was that on the course? Or yeah, on the course. Well, yeah, but when I did the course, there was a lot of stuff that just seemed to go over my head, and I was thinking, oh, you know, like you do it, you, you're doing all these different papers. But once you get your own hives, so much of it makes sense. And so much more of it made sense when I went out that week with the, the True Honeycomb. Mm. And um, 
you're able to see what they're doing and ask actually ask decent questions and you're super inquisitive when you when you know what you've studied and you put it into a practical sense whereas I'd rather instead of doing it the other way around and um, yeah no it was, it's um, for a tip to just buy buy some beekeeping books and or even just um, watching some yeah, some some online clips about beekeeping or go to a beekeeping club yeah. Um, or just tee up with the, someone who's got beehives. Or everyone's always pretty keen to, to show you and show you along some new tips and, and whatnot. Eh? Yeah, and I, I know there's a if you're in the white I know there's a night course at yeah on beekeeping. Yeah, Fraser's Beekeeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, is there anything that people might not know about you? <laughs> might not know about me. No, I think I'm a pretty open book. Anyone that does know me knows me pretty well. Yeah. Um. I'd say an open, a pretty open book. Yeah, no. Spades, spades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, pretty, I'd say just pretty extroverted. Yeah. Um, I like to do activities with the whole, you know, a bunch of people, and it's always, it's always good to have someone to talk to, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Are you the life of the party, or? Uh, Paddy party starter. <laughs> <laughs> starter of the party. Yeah, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I probably overdo it a bit, a bit you know, come in a bit hot. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I'd say pretty, pretty social on that, um, on that front. Yeah. It says it's been, been good living in, in a place like Cambridge, having a, having a hub for you guys. Yeah, it's been awesome, eh? Yeah. Um, the centralised programme is such a good programme for a high performance environment. It's the Rugby Sevens have just started, they've gone to the, the Mount and the cycling relocated up here once the Velodrome was built and all those guys and girls will tell you that it's such an awesome environment. When triathlon guys yeah, yeah triathlons here um it's awesome eh? like I, you can just walk out where, where where we live you can walk around the corner and there'd be four or five houses within five minutes walk you can just go see people after training hang out on the weekends and um yeah no it is good but uh, it doesn't it you know, has its pros and its cons so you know yeah pretty much you're with everyone that you train with all the time as well mm -hmm. um which has been good and bad in some situations. Sometimes you want to, you know, have your own privacy, but you're in a, a environment where you've got no privacy at times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd say in, on a whole, it's it's definitely an awesome environment to be in a in a um, situation like we're. Yeah. Um, you guys when you go away to Europe, are you, do you go to there the whole time for a couple of years? Yeah, well, last year was different. We came home last year. We went to Europe, did the two World Cups and came home. Yeah. Um, and then went back to World Champs. But the year before and in previous years, it's been three, three month two stints. Yeah. And the team being so big, they'll generally split the team in half. So one team will go to this block for an eight week training camp and then we'll re and then we'll come together. Um, at World Cups and mm -hmm. we'll go go away again together. Um, I think next year's uh, tour plans are to come home again. Mm -hmm. I will go to Europe and then come home. Um, yeah, uh, some people will like coming home. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's big flights coming back from Europe. It's all right when you're going over there, maybe. Um, but it's, for us, you know, like for being a big guy flying, I don't, I don't enjoy <laughs> flying. Eh? Flying sucks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not the old blacks in business class. No, no, we're in cattle class. <laughs> Even cattle class, when you and when you get in the middle of the four seater in the middle of cattle class, it is a long seventeen hour flight <laughs> to Europe. Is it quite the comedy? Like uh, no. our own crew jumping on a plane? Like are people looking at you like what's oh, happening here? Yeah, not really. I think yeah, you get a few looks when you're the tall ones. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's yeah. That's all right. Going over is not as bad as coming home. When you're coming home and you're you kind of you're tired because you've had a big campaign and um, you just want to get home, and that's when it, that's the worst part of flying is is a return journey. Mm. And yeah, those European flights are massive. They eh? they're huge. Seventeen hours on a plane is not that enjoyable. And uh, you're a sleeper, you eater, you movie, you books. What are you doing? Uh, nah, well, we all you know you take your sleeping pills, but. I don't know, like, I've watched a couple, probably more of the documentary type yeah. than the movies, but I don't know, I, on the way over, I think I watched one movie and said, you know, on that big, that big, that big leg. I don't know, 
get up. I think I just, just moving around, go to the back. A snack on whatever snacks are available at the back. Um, just chit chat and just you just got to make your that, that flight go as fast as possible. <laughs> Some people are really lucky and they can sleep, but I don't think I can sleep all that much. Yeah, it's just, it's just, so, it's just so bloody uncomfortable. Do you ever, do you ever take people to get over to your leg? Uh, on the way there, um, when once we arrive in Europe, we don't sort of use. We try to have as much natural light as possible. Yeah. So no sunglasses. Mm-hmm. Um, immerse yourself into the time zone. Pretty much, you know, like you want to go to bed as the same time that you want. You're in New Zealand. Um, I think the no sunglasses thing is probably the main one. Um, you just want to get as much natural light into your system as possible. Mm-hmm. When the sun goes down, you know it's time for bed. Yeah. yeah. That's what I've been trying to do. Even here, getting up in the morning, getting the sunshine. Yeah, yeah. And you guys are having no problem with that, being up at six in the morning? Oh, uh, I'm definitely, a, I'm not a morning person, eh? No? I struggle to go out of bed. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, I've never been good, good at getting out of bed. But once I'm up, I'm good. You know, and summer's so good. The mornings in summer are awesome, you know? That's, yeah. The sun's up at what's, t- I don't know you'd know before me. When's the sun up? Quarter to six? Around? Uh, yeah, it must be around quarter to six. I used to pull it out for that. Just before seven. Six, yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you're up, it's good. Um, and then, and then the sun gets it stays up for so long. Suddenly, you know, like we, I've tried being bed by nine, nine thirty. Yeah. And it's you know it's still quite light outside eight thirty compared to winter when you're you're training here in winter and it's dark by six o'clock. You know, so in winter you can go to bed super early. Yeah. And get some you know big ten hour nights. <laughs> but on the summer, I feel a fan pumping upstairs all the time. It's so bloody hot. Yeah. Yeah, um, where can people find the baddie? People yeah, can find me uh, social media, and, yeah. uh, you know, me Instagram, um, Facebook. I'm always pretty, pretty open to, especially with riding. It's a cool thing, you know. Like you, you meet so many young, young athletes, you know, and you're always getting friend requests. So yeah, whoever drops me a, a message there is, I'm always keen to reply. And, and um, um, otherwise, you just find me at the at the local regatta. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, if you want to talk bees. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're pretty approachable over a regatta. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, it, it definitely. Um, it, which is cool about rowing is that, you know, like, uh, all your elite team athletes, you know, all your mahe drives, guys, all your Olympians are just floating around the regatta. Yeah. So anyone can go up and talk to them, and we're always taking tours through rowing New Zealand and, yeah. and things like that, compared to, the, you know, like a sport like rugby, where kids grow up playing rugby, you're only going to see your idols at the big game at the big game on the seat watching them um but rowing it's just such a an environment where Mahe puts his boat up on the rack next to the under 16 scholar from you yeah. know Hamilton boys it's it's just how it is it's cool it's a cool environment rowing and you know it's that's awesome that sport yeah I know I know for my brothers like um after what was that? 2000 Sydney Olympics. We had Rob come, st- Rob Waddell come stay at oh, our yeah. house, and I know that when they were in the boat park, and oh, Rob Waddell, get away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it's, there's no, it's everyone's just everyone, eh? Hey? Like, yeah. If you're not, you know, one different because of what you've you've done, you're just another another athlete competing at, at a regatta. Yeah. Um, you all share the same passion for the sport, so it's yeah. cool, eh? Yeah. Um, you touched on commitment there to the to the sport and what you're doing. Is it Anything that you like to leave people with, because you're probably the perfect example of um, work can pay off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. The commitment's the main thing. Like everyone, I was, I fall, I, you know, I would fall into the trap of you'd see when you're at school, you'd see big athletes, and you think, nah, these guys are going to be big. You know, like I'm not a big athlete, I'm not a fast athlete, or I'm not good enough. But it's not if you're not good enough. There's been so many people that have potential, or they have, like, you know, but if they don't have the commitment, they're just going to fall through the cracks. Yeah. You know, if you've got the commitment, and you can, and you can, um, yeah, you can, you can go, you can go the distance. You de- you're definitely going to get the rewards in the end of the day. Awesome. Mm. So just stick at it. Cool. That'll be my biggest one. Is if you want, if you've got a goal, just stick at it. Awesome. You'll mate. Get there in the end. Cheers. Wicked. I'll let you eat. Sweet. <laughs> <Good time. laughs>